what I'd like to do tonight is I'd like to focus on a couple of passages um, in this commentary on the Heart Sutra. And uh, <clears throat> they're very clear and very elegant, um, which is to say that they represent Tukhtin Jinpa, um, turning his holiness's Tibetan into really excellent English and taking the time to do that. It's a great art to be able to do that. And Tukhtin Jinpa is a master translator. He's quite extraordinary. I mean, besides the fact that he's a Keshi, which in itself would be enough. He also has a PhD in philosophy from Cambridge University. So his command of the English language and his ability to write clearly and cogently has been very finely refined, both by his um, extraordinary education in Tibetan tradition, but also because he's had an extraordinary education in the Western philosophical tradition. I don't know of anybody else really who possesses talents like that in both areas. So when we read His Holiness's commentary, that's what we're getting. We're getting, I'm, I'm assuming that His Holiness taught this originally in Tibetan rather than in English. And then we get um, Tutin Jinpa turning it into elegant English. Um, what I'm gonna do then tonight, because the passages that I wanna look at are a little bit long, a couple pages in one case, and about a page in another case. Um, I'm going to jump back and forth with screen sharing so that you can um, look at the passages as I talk about them. But uh, before I do that, <clears throat> um, I wasn't able to obtain a digital copy of um, this text, which I would have put in the material section if I could have done so. So instead, I photographed it as best I could. But because I photographed it one page at a time, um, I need to show this to you at one page at a time. I don't know if that makes too much sense. But what I want to do, a lot of people um, listen to this talk or view this YouTube, this talk on YouTube after it's been posted. So for everybody's benefit, although it may seem a little bit strange, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show the, the different pages of the text without saying anything. And that way you all can come back to this recording and see those pages if you wanna review them. And other people can do the same thing by just stopping the recording, YouTube recording at that particular point, and then you can read the pages. I couldn't think of a more elegant way to do this. This is not even what I would call an elegant way to do things, but it will certainly work unless um, somehow um, I don't get the recording that we're making in Zoom to properly view the pages. But I tested this out in advance, so it, it should work. We shouldn't have any problems. So <clears throat> I'm gonna show you the pages of the text now, and um, then I'll go back paragraph by paragraph to, um, to talk about this. So this is the, the very first page and it's actually, okay. It's actually page 116 in the Heart Sutra commentary. <clears throat> and I've outlined more or less the place where I'm going to begin which is uh, the paragraph that begins in contrast when we say form is emptiness. And then uh, here's page 117. And then here's page 118. <clears throat> And then this note is very interesting and very important. So 
in order to get to that note, I have to backtrack. Oh, there it is. Here's note 23. And I want to talk about that after I talk about this lengthy passage. <clears throat> then we're going to jump a little bit to page 120, beginning down here, one way to understand this passage. And then, whoops, I went too far. And then to page 121, and we'll talk about this whole page. Okay, so let's go back to the very first page. <clears throat> and I'm going to read the first paragraph here. And then uh, I'll want to talk about that. And uh, after reading the paragraph, I'll turn off the screen share so that you're not just looking at a blank page. And you know, by way of a preface to this, you know, there's a very famous statement in the Heart Sutra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is not different than emptiness. Emptiness is not different than form. So emptiness here means shunyata, it's the Sanskrit. And form means physical things. It means our body for one thing, but it means any physical uh, entity at all. So here's his holiness's commentary. When we say form is emptiness, we are negating an intrinsic essence of form. This manner of being empty is called emptiness of intrinsic existence. In Tibetan, this is literally self-emptiness. We should not, however, understand this self-emptiness or emptiness of self-nature to mean that form is empty of itself. This would be tantamount to denying the reality of form, which as I have been repeatedly emphasizing, these teachings do not do. Form is form. The reality of form being form is not rejected. Only the independent and thus intrinsic existence of that reality is rejected. Thus the fact that form is thus the fact that form is form does not contradict in any way the fact that form is emptiness. Okay, so why why is this an important passage? Why is His Holiness emphasizing this? It's very easy in <clears throat> reading the Heart Sutra. Or in fact, in, in thinking about a lot of what we read about in Buddhism, uh, that sort of falls in the, the rubric of middle way thought, which is thought mostly about the empty nature of things. Or although it's clumsy English, as I often prefer to say, the devoid nature of things. It's easy to think that the negation process that goes on here when the Heart Sutra says form is emptiness, or you study emptiness in any other context, it's very easy to come to the conclusion that that means nothingness, that emptiness means nothingness. So, you know, if you've been around the Dharma for a while, especially the Dharma is taught by Tibetan teachers, you know that that's not the case. But there are many people who come to the Buddhist tradition, especially if they come to it through Zen, who think that basically what's happening in this philosophy is all of physical reality is being negated, as the reality is that nothing exists. And that what appears is complete, completely fictive and therefore the reality is the non-fictiveness of things, which means there's nothing there. And that would apply to the other four skandhas, which by the way, would include our own consciousness, which would be a little bit of a problem because then we would be coming to the conclusion that we're nothing. His holiness is making a point of saying, that's not what's going on here. And I remember when I first started translating Nagarjuna, 
in the 1970s, in the second half of the 1970s, it was common for people to think that Nagarjuna was just negating everything. That was not unusual. It was a misunderstanding, but it was a very common misunderstanding that was held in a lot of traditions. Um, for example, there's often a lot of conversation about no self in the Zen tradition. And there's a reference here that His Holiness is making to this, which is when he talks about, how does he say it? Self emptiness. In Tibetan, this is literally self emptiness. That can commonly be understood as there's no self, as in get rid of the ego. And a lot of people made a lot of attempts to get rid of their egos. Well, in the Tibetan tradition, they're saying, no, no, that's not, this is, this, this is not what this is about. There is something very specific being negated when the term emptiness, when the term emptiness is being used, something very specific is being negated. So to say that something is empty is not to say that it doesn't exist, but to say that it's devoid of something particular. It's not to say that there's nothing there. There is something there. There's at least an appearance there, okay? But Nagarjuna is saying, and His Holiness is saying through his tradition, that emptiness negates something extremely particular, which is here translated as intrinsic existence, sometimes translated as inherent existence. Sometimes the term that's used is self nature. Okay. The reason these terms are used is what is being negated is a particular mode of being. So let me try and explain this. I mean, I, I think maybe a number of you have heard this explanation from me before, but I'm thinking some of you haven't. And also, I, I don't know who's listening to this recording, so they may not either, maybe new to you. Um, <clears throat> Intrinsic, let me get that out. Intrinsic existence or inherent existence means a quality that is intrinsic to a phenomenon. And I'm going to use the word phenomenon rather than thing because I want to, I want to emphasize the relational nature. We relate to, I mean, we're, we cognize things, right? Okay, so the phenomenon or the thing does not have a nature that's intrinsic to it, if this makes any sense, that inheres to it. For example, if I look at this pen, the natural way in which I see this pen is something that is simply there. That penness that I can use it to write is a characteristic of this. That characteristic inheres to it because it's a pen, right? So the, the ability to write penness is in this thing that I'm holding. <clears throat> Nagarjuna is saying, and his Holiness is saying, and the Heart Sutra is saying, that's not true. That this is a piece of plastic and I can use it to write. But the notion that it's a pen is a notion. And writing is not necessarily a characteristic of what I'm holding. I mean, easily, if I hold it this way with the the ballpoint down here, I can write. 
if I hold it this way, I can't write, right? So writing is not inherent in this thing. Something else has to happen for writing to happen, okay? I don't know if this is the best example of what I'm trying to talk about, but penness therefore is something I'm attributing to this. And it only happens, penness only happens under certain circumstances. Under other circumstances, penness doesn't happen. No matter what I do, if I write with, you know, the plastic end of the pen, nothing's going to happen. Okay. Now, something else about this is that when I just look at it, it seems to just be there. I don't see it as a process. I just see it as a thing sitting there. But the reality is that the only reason it's sitting on my desk is because there's a whole concatenation of causes and conditions that have come together for it to be on my desk. But we never see those things. Now, this is kind of a trivial example, but maybe it'll make the point. Those causes and conditions are absolutely essential for the existence of this pen. Not just that it's sitting on my desk, but that it even exists, right? I mean, this is plastic, right? So ultimately, it was refined from oil, which is to say, ultimately, it was a bunch of ferns and dinosaurs 60 million or 100 million years ago. And those ferns and dinosaurs, you know, got compressed in the ground over this enormous period of time. And then Exxon sucked it out of the ground, shipped it to, I don't know, New Orleans or wherever, and it got refined, turned into plastic. And then some company bought blocks of it, right? And turned it into this very cool shape. And somebody else created this ballpoint pen, put it together and sold it to me, and then I bought it. <clears throat> All of that stuff is implicated in this thing being in my hand. We never see that. But if one bit of all of those causes and conditions were to have not happened, this pen wouldn't be in my hand. Maybe something else would be in my hand, but this pen would not be in my hand. Okay, again, that might sound sort of trivial. But here's something non-trivial about this. That's only in regards to the past. What about the future? Okay, this is a refillable pen, so I just keep refilling it. But at some point, what's going to happen to this piece of plastic? <clears throat> well, I'm mortal. I'm going to die. And when I die, this pen is probably going to end up in the trash. <coughs> probably nobody else is going to want it. That means it's going to get hauled from here about three miles from here, which is where all the waste from Santa Fe is being buried. I know this because it's right next to the archery range where I go to shoot, all right? And then this is gonna sit in the ground for how long? Centuries, thousands of years. I don't know how long this is gonna sit in the ground, right? I mean, if you think about things ecologically, which these days we're starting to, but people didn't used to. There's something <coughs> quite pernicious about this pen. It'd be much better if it was made out of wood rather than plastic, right? Because wood would decompose a lot faster than plastic would. And we live in a world that we're polluting at an unbelievable rate and with extraordinary intensity, because nobody thinks about the fact that things go somewhere. Things come from somewhere and things go somewhere. We only see this right here, right now, with whatever utility we attribute to it, but we don't see the flow of its existence. 
the Heart Sutra is reminding us that everything flows in a certain kind of way. How is it reminding us that everything flows in a certain kind of way? It's telling us that all forms are emptiness. What does it mean that all forms are emptiness? What are the characteristics of emptiness? Well, His Holiness goes on to talk about this. The fact that things are devoid of an inherent existence, the fact that things are devoid in their nature of the qualities we project onto them is what allows them to change. So this is a, sort of a complicated thing that I think is often problematic for people to understand. Let me find the passage here in the commentary and show it to you. Okay, so this next paragraph, this is a crucial point and it's worth reiteration. Emptiness does not imply non-existence. Emptiness implies the emptiness of intrinsic existence. The emptiness of intrinsic existence necessarily implies dependent origination. Dependent origination means that dependent origination means that things arise in dependence on causes and conditions. Dependence and interdependence, another term for the same thing, is the nature of all things. Things and events come into being only as a result of causes and conditions. Here's the key thing. Emptiness makes the law of cause and effect possible, right? To, to say emptiness is to say dependent origination. To say dependent origination is to say emptiness. The fact that things don't have the qualities that we attribute to them is what allows them to come into being and pass out of being. So this pen that I see just sitting there, if it really was merely there and was always there, it could never change. If it were permanent, what would that mean? To never change is to be permanent. If it were permanent, it couldn't originate. Because if it's permanent, it's always there. I mean, this is the philosophical argument. And more importantly, perhaps, from an ecological point of view, if it was permanent, it could never disappear. In fact, there are chemicals around now. We call them forever chemicals that apparently are permanent. They never disappear. However, <clears throat> most phenomena aren't like that. Okay, so this is an important point. Although in a philosophical say, in a philosophical sense, we could say that emptiness is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice tonight. In a philosophical way, we could say that emptiness is understood in relationship to transitory phenomena, to use that language. But actually, a better way to say this is emptiness and transitoriness are the exact same thing, okay? It's just that we don't tend to see that. All right, let, let me stop for a minute now. I mean, I, I'd like to check in with people and see if this is, if this is making sense. Because if it's not making sense, I wanna talk about what, what it is that's not being understood because it's the critical thing in this philosophy. So I want to check in. Does anybody want to, does anybody have questions about this idea 
or some confusion that needs to be surfaced that we can sort out? If so, you know, please raise your hand using the, there's a hand raise function or, or just unmute yourself and pop in and tell me what's on your mind. Because I don't want to go any farther until we're, we're, we're good with this. Is it that there's a necessity for an emptiness to transition into? Into what? If, if you're transitioning from one state to another or from one instant to another, the instant you're transitioning into has to be empty for you to get into it. Both moments have to be empty or devoid of solidity and independence, autonomy, or permanence. So when you leave one instant, that you empty that instant to go into another instant, which you occupy, and then you just jump from hole to hole. <laughs> well, it's not really quite like that. It's not so much that you're jumping from hole to hole. I'm getting, I'm getting what the image is that, that you have. But what you're doing is you're reifying emptiness. You know what reifying means, Lou? Re okay, just in case somebody else doesn't know. Okay, reify means to turn a concept into a thing. Okay. So, His Holiness is very specific in saying that emptiness is not some kind of an entity, right? And when you're talking about emptiness as like a whole, right? Then you're talking about emptiness as if it's some kind of a thing. Let me see if I can find his specific words. It is important to clarify, well, actually, why don't I do a screen share so everybody can see this? while I'm reading it. This is on page 117. Right here. It is important to clarify that we are not speaking of emptiness as some kind of absolute strata of reality, akin to say the ancient Indian concept of Brahman, which is conceived to be an underlying absolute reality <clears throat> from which the illusory world of multiplicity emerges. Emptiness is not a core reality lying somehow at the heart of the universe from which the diversity of phenomena arise. Emptiness can only be conceived of in relation to individual things and events. I'll finish reading a paragraph and then I'll come back to what we're talking about specifically. Now. For example, when we speak of the emptiness of a form, we are talking about the ultimate reality of that form, the fact that it is devoid of intrinsic existence. That emptiness is the ultimate nature of that form. Emptiness exists only as a quality of a particular phenomenon. Emptiness does not exist separately and independently of particular phenomena. So, in your image, Lou, of sort of going from one hole to another hole, it, it seems that what you've done is you imagine emptiness is like an empty space. And there's one moment of empty space, and then you go into another moment of empty space. But emptiness is, it, as it were, a characteristic of something. So from one moment to another moment, right? That empty, that empty nature of that something is the same from one moment to the next moment. So it's it could lot. be, so it could be like you're saying that emptiness is like an object may have a color and that object also has emptiness. So emptiness is a characteristic of that object. Yes, you could say that. You could say that emptiness is a characteristic of that object. You could say that emptiness is the nature of that object. So moment by moment, the emptiness of that object exists as long as the object exists. 
And if the and His Holiness says this someplace, if the object ceases to exist, then emptiness ceases to exist, right? So it's as as he says, it's not like there's this great emptiness somewhere, and then <clears throat> things are sort of emerging out of that emptiness, like um, like something popping out of the water, like a fish popping out of the water, or um, maybe crystals um, emerging, or, or maybe like snow coming out of the sky, right? So when there's a lot of moisture in the sky and the temperature drops, <clears throat> the moisture precipitates out of the sky in the form of snowflakes, right? So the moisture is always there, you couldn't see it, and then it gets colder and suddenly, you know, something precipitates out. So it's not like emptiness is like that sky and then phenomena precipitate out of it. <coughs> but emptiness is the characteristic of all things all the time. Does that clarify it? Yes. Okay. And, and that's really important because um, where we're going to uh, in tonight's talk and then where I'm going to pick up in great detail next week is meditation on emptiness. So meditation on emptiness is not meditating on nothing. It's not like just emptying out your mind and okay, now I'm meditating on emptiness because I've emptied out my mind. <clears throat> In fact, to, to take sort of a historic turn here, um, in, uh, <clears throat> I think it was in the eighth century in Tibet, maybe it was the ninth century, maybe it was around early 800s. No, I can't remember anymore. I'm getting too old to remember details like this, like specific dates. But there was a time when Buddhism was first um, developing in Tibet. And the influences that were coming into Tibet were primarily from uh, India and from China. So there were Chinese Buddhist monks in Tibet, just as there were monks from Nalanda and other monasteries in Tibet, or non-monastics like Padmasambhava. You know, they were they were in Tibet. They were bringing Buddhism to Tibet, and. Uh, the, the Chinese primarily were followers of the, the Chan or the Zen school of Buddhism. And the way that that teaching was appearing to the Tibetans at the time was that the doctrine was if you could just stop thinking, which is to say to empty your mind, move into a space where your mind was completely empty, then you would have accomplished the goal of Buddhist practice. And one of, so there's a big debate between the Indian monks and the Chinese monks over this issue because there's been a lot of conflict between them. And so the emperor uh, created basically a debate and said, whoever wins, this is the kind of Buddhism we're gonna have. Things were probably more complicated than that because there was probably a lot of tension. Uh, in the Tibetan Empire at that time about what cultural influences were going to predominate in Tibet and what weren't. But aside from all of that, <clears throat> one of the uh, Tibetans pointed out that if the um, Chinese monks were correct, then basically all that you had to do to become a Buddha was to get hit over the head with a hammer so that you couldn't think, and then you would be a Buddha which obviously is not going to be true. So that was one of the things that was said about this. So meditating on emptiness is not emptying your head, is the point. It's not emptying your mind. There's something much more uh, difficult actually going on than that. And um, we'll come to that um, possibly at the end of tonight's talk, but certainly next week. Um, <clears throat> so I'm kind of riffing on um, 
lose image a little bit. I'm going kind of far afield from what you were talking about, but Lou sort of gave me the opportunity or the segue to do that. But anyhow, so we've answered Lou's question. Uh, are there more questions? Because it's, it's important to take the opportunity to say, okay, this is the way I understand things. And um, what do you think? You know, can we polish this up a little bit? Any other questions? Okay. I mean, this is an old tradition to do this sort of thing. We don't always have the opportunity to do it. When I was uh, translating Nagarjuna with Kim Sonam Rinchen, he would stop every once in a while and he would ask me some questions and I invariably gave him the wrong answer. I don't think I gave him the right answer once. Sometimes he laughed so hard that I thought he was gonna fall off his chair. It was, I mean, quite embarrassing, right? I mean, but, uh, you know, it's the way to get things sorted out. And it did help me to understand what it was we were working on. Okay. So let's go back to the text. <clears throat> we don't have more questions because I'm going to assume that we're pretty clear. Wait a minute, there's a chat here. Let's see what this is. Oh, no, that's about something else. Okay, never mind. Let's go back to the screen share. Furthermore, this is holiness now. Furthermore, since emptiness can only be understood as ultimate reality in relation to individual phenomena, individual things and events, that's what he means by phenomena. When an individual phenomenon ceases to exist, the emptiness of that phenomenon will also cease to exist. So that was the point that I was making less elegantly earlier. So, although emptiness is not itself the product of causes and conditions, when the basis for identifying emptiness no longer exists, the emptiness of that thing also ceases to exist. So here we're making the point that emptiness does not represent some ontological thing or condition or circumstance or state. It's not like God who somehow exists someplace or the Tao who somehow exists someplace, right? Emptiness only exists because a specific phenomenon exists. And when it ceases to exist, the emptiness of it ceases to exist. When David dies, the empty or devoid nature of David will be gone. Not just David, but the devoid, empty nature of David will be gone. It's not like emptiness is somehow David's soul, which persists. Now, the empty nature of David's consciousness might exist, right? That's a different issue. And that actually gets us to this note 23, which is very important. And this is something that Tupton Jimpa is saying. I don't think this is something that His Holiness was saying. So I'm going to read this. In Vajrayana meditation practice, it is thus emphasized that when one meditates on emptiness within the context of deity yoga, it is important to choose a basis for one's meditation. I'm going to read the whole thing and then come back to it because this is really very, very important. It is important to choose a basis for one's meditation. This basis can be the aspect of the mind that will retain its continuity throughout an individual's lives until the attainment of enlightenment. The fact that the mind will continue on into the stage of enlightenment is one of the main reasons that the mind is often emphasized as the focus of emptiness meditation. This is also the case in other practices, such as Maha Mudra and Dzogchen, wherein the main focus of meditation on emptiness is one's mind. <coughs> let, me, let me talk about this paragraph 
because I consider it so important. And I'm going to leave it on the screen as I talk about it, because I want you to be able to see it and think about it at the same time. In Vajrayana pra meditation practice, it is thus emphasized that when one meditates on emptiness within the context of deity yoga, it is important to choose a basis for one's meditation. Here, when he says basis, he's saying that's an aspect of the mind, but what he's not being clear about is that he's talking about meditation on an image of a bodhisattva, like Manjushri, Chenrezig, Tara, right? These are aspects of one's mind. Manjushri is the enlightened wisdom aspect of everyone's mind. Tara is the enlightened, energetic, compassionate aspect of one's mind. Uh, Manjushri Avalokiteshvara is the enlightened, compassionate aspect of one's mind. So when you're meditating on a deity, right, you're meditating on an aspect of your own mind. But in Vajrayana practice, one stage is to visualize the deity and develop calm abiding on that deity, which is to say, to keep the mind focused as one pointedly as possible on that deity and return one's attention all the time to that deity. Okay. Now, earlier on, there was a technique that Mama Yeshi was talking about. And this was in the, uh, one of the lectures on the principal aspects of Buddhism or the essence of Tibetan Buddhism was the name of the book, right? <clears throat> he talks about when you're meditating, thoughts will occur and you'll be distracted, let the thoughts go and go back to meditating on the clear nature of your own mind. That's actually Mahamudra meditation. But it's also meditation practice if you're doing deity yoga. If you're visualizing yourself as Tara, which is to say you're trying to cultivate the Tara aspect of yourself, which is not fully developed, then you're developing it by cultivating that image and that sense of I am Tara, right? As random thoughts occur, you let them go and you go back to that image of yourself as Tara. That's the basis that he's talking about here. But there's another meditation practice, which is understanding the empty nature of Tara. Because all phenomena are, have an empty nature, right? That's their reality in an ultimate sense, including mental phenomena. And when you have a mental image of yourself as Tara, then what you're doing is you're seeing an aspect of your own mind as Tara. And your mind has an empty nature also. So your a very profound practice is to begin to understand the empty nature, the devoid nature of yourself as Tara. This is not an easy practice. You need to understand what emptiness means and then apply it to the meditation of yourself as Tara. It's actually a very profound and powerful practice. But it's a very important practice. It's one of the fundamental practices in Vajrayana. You don't just meditate yourself as Tara. You meditate yourself as Tara with an understanding of the devoid nature of Tara. Very important. You know, very important that you don't see yourself as a concrete physical thing, Tara. That would just reinforce delusion. Right? So the emptiness nature of Tara is important. And that's what's being emphasized here. This basis can be the aspect of the mind that will retain its continuity throughout an individual's lives into the attainment of enlightenment. So you're meditating yourself as Tara, not in this life, but in future lives. You're cultivating this Tara nature until you become a Buddha. Okay. He references then other practices such as Mahamudra and Dzogchen, 
but he doesn't go into this in detail here. But I'm looking at the time, and what I'm going to do next week is I'm going to jump off from this point, and I'm going to jump into the commentary in Geshe Rabten's book about how to do this practice. All right. Because the whole point of understanding what's in the Heart Sutra is not just in a sort of philosophical sense to know the nature of things. I mean, that's nice. But the point is to transform your mind. I mean, the point of all this practice is to become liberated from samsara and ultimately become a Buddha. It's not to have a philosophical understanding of the nature of things, just to have a philosophical understanding of the nature of things. As His Holiness says over and over again, just understanding Buddhist philosophy as such is pretty much useless. What is the point of doing that? I mean, well, I guess if you're a professor, that's how you earn your living. But from the point of view of Buddhist practice, that's not the point, right? From the point of view of Buddhist practice, the point is to be transformed, to get out of the mess that we're all in, which is called samsara. Okay, so this meditation on the empty nature of yourself as the deity is one of the key Vajrayana practices for the exit from samsara. And this is often not seen when one studies the perfection of wisdom sutras or middle way philosophy, which is what the perfection of wisdom sutras are. It's easy to forget that this is all about experience. So his holiness now reemphasizes that in the next passage that we're going to come to. So let me do the screen share again. And we're going to go to page 116. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whoops, I'm going backwards when I do that. It's not what I want to do. I want to go to page 120. Back to this idea of form is emptiness, emptiness is form. But he goes on to say that this idea extends to the remaining aggregates. That's in this paragraph here. Feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. And this is key. Consciousness is empty. Emptiness is consciousness. Consciousness is not different than emptiness. Emptiness is not different than consciousness. It's the same formulation as when we talk about form is emptiness, emptiness is form. For all five skandhas, this is implicated. Now he goes on. One way to understand this passage is from the perspective of a meditator realizing emptiness directly. So he's pulling us back into meditation practice. He's pulling us away from abstract philosophy. He's pulling us away from the mere analysis of what are things, what are feelings, the true nature of feelings, the true nature of consciousness. One way to understand this passage is from the perspective of a meditator realizing emptiness directly. Such a person directly perceives the complete absence of independent reality of all things and events directly perceiving emptiness alone. Now, if you can imagine such a state, okay? Directly perceiving emptiness alone. In such a state, no multiplicity is experienced. There is no form, no feelings, no sensation, no perception, no mental formulation, no mental formations, nor anything else at all. <clears throat> There is nothing but emptiness because this insight is arrived at only through the process of negating the intrinsic reality of, for instance, form. But you could also say negating the intrinsic reality of consciousness. Form is a conventional reality, a relative phenomenon. And relative phenomena are only known through conventional perception 
conventional perception is what we're experiencing right now when you're listening. You're having a conventional perception known as hearing. However, the emptiness of the form is the ultimate truth or ultimate reality of that form. And that ultimate reality is attained only through an ultimate analysis, only through the mind that realizes the ultimate nature of reality. I'll come back to this. While the mind perceives emptiness directly, it perceives nothing else. And so within such a perspective, there is no longer subject and object. Okay. I've talked about the clear light and the clear light of death. All right. Within such a perspective, there is no longer subject and object. That's what happens at the moment of death. It's called the clear light. But here the experience is a meditative experience. He goes on to reiterate in regards to form is emptiness and emptiness is form. And perhaps more significantly, consciousness or mind is emptiness and mind or consciousness, and emptiness is mind or consciousness. Therefore, one way of reading the statement that there is no form, no feelings, no sensation, no perception, no mental formations in emptiness is from the perspective of a meditator immersed in the direct realization of emptiness. Now, there's something critical in all this. That ultimate reality and when he talks about that ultimate reality, that's the state he's talking about. We have a medit we have a person meditating the, on the ultimate nature of phenomena, phenomena, all phenomena, not just one, all phenomena. And they gain that direct perception, not simply through concentration of the mind. And this is another place where this type of practice is distinct from, say, Zen, for example. I'm not knocking Zen. I'm just making some clarification here. In order to get to this experience of the direct perception of the emptiness of all phenomena, such that no phenomena even appear to the meditator, because there's no longer a subject and an object, in order to get to that place, one begins with developing an intellectual understanding of the meaning of emptiness in the way we've been discussing earlier in this hour. All right. when, understand, when one understands that the true nature of all phenomena, which is not their appearance, but their actual reality, one understands this first by intellectually developing an understanding of what emptiness is, right? And upon that intellectual understanding, then applying that intellectual understanding to one's experience of things. This is called analytic meditation. When that analytic meditation becomes sharp and penetrating so that you really deeply understand that Every phenomenon that you look at has an empty nature, which is why it can even exist. It couldn't exist any other way, except to have a devoid, empty nature. When you understand that absolutely clearly and completely, and you think about that in relationship to your own mind or your own consciousness, and that's where it gets really difficult. It's very difficult to apply this idea to your own consciousness, which we see as permanent, as being always there. When that happens, when you can do that, okay, when you can hold that understanding of the empty nature of your own consciousness or anything else, right, then you've achieved shamatha, right, calm abiding, on the nature of your own mind, combined with an analytic understanding. When that happens, all phenomena disappear. 
is what he's saying, in the sense that nothing permanent, solid, any longer appears to you. That you're in the state, which is also called the clear light mind, without having to be dying. And this is called being a Buddha. And that's what this meditation is about, right? Remember that this conversation is happening between Shariputra, I mean, that's the conversation of the Heart Sutra is happening between Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara. Not two ordinary human beings that are having this conversation, right? So these, these are people who can get into this state of mind, right? And that's what they're talking about, right? So that's the profundity of the heart suture that's kind of buried in here, right? It's about how to practice. It's not about merely the nature of reality. It's about how to practice. Okay, now that, that was a lot of stuff to kind of lay on you to understand. So once again, I wanna stop and let's talk about this and any questions that people have about this because it's kind of it's kind of a critical it's it's a critical point in doing vajrayana meditation i mean let me just say one more thing then let me stop for some questions it's my sense that often students who are studying the dharma get a lot of different stuff kind of tossed at them from different directions there's some lam rim over here and we're going to do some meditation on Tara over there. And, you know, we want to act ethically. And so here's some teaching about something else over here and, you know, so on and so forth. And it's like, how do these pieces fit together? It's not entirely clear how all these pieces fit together. So what this commentary that His Holiness is giving us on the Heart Sutra is saying, this is how all these pieces fit together. This is how Vajrayana fits in the framework of the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra is about how bodhisattvas see reality, not how you and I see reality. But this is how we can get to the place that we start seeing things in the same way as a bodhisattva like Shariputra sees things, right? And then everything else becomes implicated because it becomes, it becomes a framework upon which everything else can be attached. And so you can see where morality fits in. You can understand how the long room teachings fit in and so on and so forth. Hopefully you see my point here. Okay, so let's stop and if there are any questions, let's take them because this is very profound stuff. Now, if there are no questions, I'll just drink my tea because I am losing my voice. It may be best you just think about all of this over the next week, and then we can come back to it again, you know, when we, when we pick up this theme um, a week from tonight and try and move forward. Because, yeah, it may be something that needs to percolate around in your own mind for a while before you start thinking, well, wait a minute, what did that mean? How does this work? You know, and if you have thoughts that like, okay, I don't get it, Write them down, you know, go back to this recording so that you can read the text if you don't happen to have the text. And, you know, bring your questions the next time we meet because, I mean, this is cool. This is interactive. This is not like a YouTube video where, you know, okay, you're just gonna listen to it. And you don't have the opportunity to say, have a conversation with me. I mean, that's true for some people. Aida, yeah. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, what helps me have a glimpse of this emptiness is understanding interdependence. That's where I start, you know, how things are created. Uh, what are the results of all these causes? And that gives me a glimpse of uh, all this designation that we give to things and we create our own reality in that way. You've got it completely. Yeah, you've got it completely. All right, what else can I say? 
See, that is the that is the meditation and dependent arising, or as interdependence, the same word. And then you see things for what they truly are. And then you see their empty nature. So you're seeing their empty. And Sankaba says this, the Buddha says this. When you see dependent origination, you see emptiness. When you see emptiness, you see dependent origination. So say no more. <laughs>